Hi, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our webinar series again. Uh, I'm Dr. Kalai, uh, the director for the Institute of Greek Research at the NIH uh, KKM. It is a privilege to welcome you all on board for our second series of webinar. Last year, at this time, we faced the COVID-19 at the start of the pandemic. A year down the road, we are still in the pandemic and there is still no exit point although there is some uh, hope from the vaccine that's been rolled out and also the better management strategies by our frontliners as well as our infectious disease uh, clinicians. It's a privilege that the ICR has been engaged with this uh, webinar series. Certainly the cooperation with the president, Dr. Anusha, the Malaysian Society of Infection Control and Infectious Diseases. She approached us uh, uh, not too long ago about putting this together. And I'm really excited that we have a rich panel of speakers over the next uh, five weeks. And this is a regular session now. And uh, the ICR is more than happy to host this for the benefit of uh, many of you out there who will need to have an update on what is going on in the COVID-19 medical management, certainly, and some of the issues surrounding the infection control and the rollout of the nursing staff and so on and so forth. And uh, the idea of this whole webinar series is to get a regular attendance so that all of us keep track of the development that is being undertaken in this COVID-19 medical management. I'd like to thank the host for today, Dr. Dr. Christopher Lee, who was also instrumental in the first webinar series together with Dr. Dr. Gopi Ping. And the team behind this are led by Dr. Cheng Hoon and her colleagues at the ICR. I also like to thank Dr. Anusha for putting together the panel of speakers and to also thank Dr. Yasmin Ghani for being the first speaker for this year's part of the webinar series. I hope you all enjoyed the session and please keep this uh, line for every Wednesday afternoon at uh, 3 to 4.30 for this particular session. Thank you very much and have an enjoyable session. All right. A very good afternoon to everyone. So on behalf of the Malaysian uh, Society of Infection Control and Infectious Diseases, I welcome all of you today to this uh, webinar series. And I thank you all for taking the time off out of your busy schedule to actually attend this series. It's a one hour series. So Malaysian Society of Infection Control and Infectious Diseases um, it's a society comprising of infectious disease physicians. It also um, has medical officers who have a passion in infectious diseases. And we also have personnel from the antimicrobial uh, stewardship and also the infection control uh, units with us. And this society was formed in March 2020. Now, this society aims at promoting education, awareness, research in the field of infectious diseases, infection control, and antimicrobial resistance. So we have an exciting calendar of events and activities lined up for this whole year. For further details, please visit our website at myisit.com. And I sincerely hope um, all of you would benefit from this inaugural five series uh, webinar that we are hosting today. All right, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would now like to welcome all of you on behalf of my IC and ICR and wish you all a very interactive and fruitful session with our esteemed speaker, Dr. Yasmin, and our dearest moderator, Dr. Christopher Lee. I pass it back to Dr. Chris for the moderation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Anusha. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kala and Dr. Anusha, for your introductory words. Uh, well, we are back again with... Uh, with COVID-19, I think we are going to be with this for quite a while. Now, the reason why we have chosen this topic on COVID-19 management is, well, we have one year of experience uh, looking after this disease uh, in, the, in the last one year. Uh, a lot has changed. Uh, some false promises and fall, false dawns like hydroxychloroquine, things like remdesivir, that at the end turned out not to be as great as initially thought of. Uh, so we thought it would be a good time to revisit this area of COVID-19 management because the new policy from the Ministry of Health now is to decentralize uh, COVID-19 management beyond the usual government hospitals. So moving forward, more and more uh, specialists, clinicians from various sectors, including the private sector, will be brought into play 
for the management of COVID-19. So the focus of today's session is really looking at how COVID-19 is managed in this country uh, with the equipment, uh, with the medicines that we have here. So it is a very Malaysian way of looking after COVID-19. Uh, our speaker is none other than Dr. Yasmin Ghani. He, she has been involved in the care of COVID-19 patients from the very beginning here in Malaysia, uh, where she serves in hospitals in Nagulo. So she will be showing you not just a short lecture, but also cases that illustrate how COVID-19 patients are managed in this country. Uh, so I'm certain that you will find her session very beneficial and enjoyable. Uh, a quick word about who Dr. Yasmin is. Uh, Dr. Yasmin is an ID consultant who has trained in Hospital Sungai Bulo, as well as in the National University in Singapore. Uh, she, as I mentioned before, she has a very strong interest in infection control and she has been an integral part of the COVID-19 management team at Hospital Sungai Bulo. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Yasmin uh, for today's lecture. Uh, before I pass it over to her, I would urge you to put in questions. As usual, our usual standard way of doing using Slido, so I'm sure you're familiar with that. So please put up your questions uh, for her to deal with, and I assure you we will try to answer as many questions as time permits this afternoon. So with that, Yasmin, you have the privilege and honor of starting the My IC and ICR's webinar series for this year, 2021. Yasmin Gani. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chris, and um, uh, special thanks to Dr. Kalai again. It's always been uh, a great honor to be part of the NIH team, and uh, thanks, thanks, Anusha, and the IC team for putting this together. I'll just start sharing my. Um, um, can you all see my slides? Uh, yes, we can. Yes, yep. Okay. So I'll go, I'll go straight into it. So what I'll be doing is basically uh, telling you all, uh, showing you all um, some of the uh, latest uh, updates that we have been uh, managing when it comes to managing uh, COVID-19. And of course, some of the lessons along the way that we have learned when it comes to uh, managing more uh, serious COVID patients. So, sorry. Oops. All right. So uh, disclaimer here. And um, of course, at the moment, um, this is a very um, uh, important question that a lot of people ask. Uh, um, we know that a confirmed case is basically RT-PCR. So this is our uh, uh, slight courtesy of CPRC. This is our case definition at the moment, clinical criteria, epidemiological criteria. And of course, a confirmed case is an RT-PCR, which has the most highest sensitivity and specificity. But at the moment, because we are having such a huge influx of cases and as well as uh, significant uh, uh, outbreaks in various centers. A lot of uh, centers are actually using RTK antigen to also diagnose um, uh, COVID positive uh, cases because RT-PCR's turnaround time in certain places can be a bit slow. So RTK antigen can be taken as a significant result and be treated as a confirmed case if the patient fits the clinical criteria or has a, a disease compatible to COVID-19 or they actually have a strong epid link. So we can also use RTK antigen now in order to diagnose, uh, in order to treat, start treating a patient as, as, as COVID-19 and we don't have to wait for the PCRs. Um, this is our clinical category at the moment, uh, clinical, uh, clinical stage one asymptomatic, two will be symptomatic patients with no pneumonia, three will be symptomatic with pneumonia, four will be pneumonias requiring oxygen, and five will be critically ill patients with multi-organ involvement. I will be touching on category one to category four. And um, uh, according to WHO, so I suppose our category one to three will signify mild disease, and those with four and five will be more severe disease of COVID-19, right? This is, this is a very famous slide by now, but basically we know now um, COVID-19 has got uh, three distinct phases, which may overlap each other at some point. So the early infection is where the virus gains entry into the nasal epithelium or the mucosal epithelium. And during this time, majority of the patient will have a very self-limited uh, uh, disease. Here, they'll probably get, they'll either be asymptomatic or they'll develop very 
um, uh, limited, uh, self-limiting flu-like illness, and most will actually recover from here. A majority of people go on and develop category three disease or the early start of the pulmonary phase. During the early start of the pulmonary phase, we will start seeing chest X-ray changes at this point, and um, prob as the disease, as the virus sort of uh, uh, goes down to the lower respiratory tract illness and it starts replicating, it will start uh, setting off a limited um, uh, cytokine response from the body. And on most patients, this is enough to uh, arrest the disease and they don't go on and develop more severe uh, diseases. In certain risk of patients, those who are high risk of certain category, they go on and develop category four and category five disease. This is where there's an intense tapering of the viral response, but it sets off a host inflammatory response. Now, a lot of times when I teach uh, uh, COVID-19, I do bring in the analogy of dengue infection. And it's in, there, in a lot of ways, it is quite similar where in certain patients, the virus is long gone, but it sets off a host inflammatory response and goes on into the category five disease, which is, uh, which is the, these people requiring more uh, uh, extensive uh, oxygen support. They go on and develop, uh, uh, they get ventilated or, or, or need high flow nasal cannula. Right. So one thing we, one of the biggest lessons that we learned was basically timing of treatment is extremely critical. So the uh, a patient with stage one disease, stage two disease, stage three disease may have interventions at very timely intervals in order to try and prevent the disease going on to the ultimate stage. So one of the most important things that we may need to pick up is when the stage one turns into stage two and the patient's oxygen saturation starts going down. If unrecognized, Many patients actually develop very late disease and a lot of them come in during this time where the inflammatory phase is high and the oxygen saturation is very low. And when we start intervening at this point, may, um, it could be that some patients may not respond very well, right? So that's why I say timing of treatment is actually very critical. All right, and how do we pick this up? So routinely in the hospital, we do this exertional DSEC test. So anyone who's had any experience with PCP, HIV and PCP, it's similar to this. Think PCP-like illness without much cyanosis. So we typically ask patients to stand and sit, stand and sit for about one, one uh, minute or so. They can do it on a chair or they can even do it at their bedside. And we basically look at a positive, uh, a 3% drop of SpO2 from baseline. And we take this as seriously. And when we, uh, when we uh, uh, compare this with the CRP rise and, and some of the biochemical uh, factors that uh, correlates, that correlates a worsening disease, uh, this may mean that the patient is actually going into a more hyperinflammatory phase. Of course, certain patients who are already hypoxic, immobile, you know, advanced pregnancy, those who just had surgery, we don't actually ask them to actually do the exertional dyspnea test. All right. And in some patients, some patients, the drop may not be very significant. So you will still have a patient who's probably a bit lethargic. They may be just maybe a 2% drop in the oxygen saturation, but you know that this patient is actually heading towards a hyperinflammatory phase or is going to soon start requiring oxygen. So in these patients, we look for biochemical evidence of an inflammatory response. And some of them, a CRP, a raising CRP, or a single value more than 50 milligrams per liter, or a neutrophil lymphocyte ratio uh, more than 3.13. If you are very, so again, want to calculate the NLR ratio, just look at an increasing neutrophil count, all right? An increasing neutrophil percentage. Many people start antibiotics, but that's not what it is. Neutrophil, increasing neutrophil, lymph, uh, uh, neutrophil percentage in COVID-19 could be the start of a hyperinflammatory phase, all right? And uh, I'll go through this very quickly. This is basically based on the first two uh, uh, waves that we had. Uh, this is uh, giving a, a, a 
uh, sort of like a roadmap of how the disease has been in our in our uh, in our country. As you know, uh, 49 to 50 percent of patients actually are asymptomatic and the infection drops. All right, about 50 percent of them develop symptoms, and out of them, 88 percent of them are actually mild disease. And if you actually look at the percentage who develops, about six percent of total patients require uh, develop severe disease and require supplemental oxygen. Hmm? All right, so let's have a quick look at uh, uh, asymptomatic one and two. All right, so uh, depending on which state you're on, uh, mild illness category patients with no risk factors, they're basically young patients, uh, less than 40 years old, uh, 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 40 to 50 years old, are uh, basically admitted or uh, required to do home isolation. Now I know Selangor is admitting everyone, but basically these are the kind of uh, 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 advice we should be giving people, uh, you know, uh, stay by yourself, don't be with other people, uh, um, uh, separate your laundry, disinfect your uh, surfaces. If you use a bathroom, just make sure it's a separate bathroom. And of course, and UM came up with this and basically uh, practice good hand hygiene, respiratory hygiene, and of course, a detailed uh, uh, um, um, a sort of advice for the caregivers there as well, uh, you know, and always tell them to watch out for warning signs, which we'll go through later. All right. So these are the monitoring guidelines of whoever is admitting uh, stable patients, uh, patients who are symptomatic without pneumonia. This is category three patients. Vital signs monitoring about eight to 12 hourly. Doctors review. We generally see patients twice a day and um, uh, we take blood tests on baseline and then we repeat it at any point if the patient has any warning signs. We do a chest X-ray at first presentation and basically repeat a chest X-ray if patient develops warning signs. And of course, patients with diabetic, hypertensive, advanced age, we, we do an ECG. All right, so this is uh, uh, category three with pneumonia. I think the slides were switched a little bit. Okay, so these are the common questions that we generally encounter on patients with uh, category three. A lot of physicians ask us this question. So who do we require antiviral? So how often to monitor blood parameters and chest X-ray? Who are more likely to deteriorate and when to discharge? All right, let's see. So this has been our landscape of uh, patients who are being admitted. As you know, majority of them have mild disease and a very small majority, small minority go on and develop severe disease. So about 8% of these patients go on to develop severe disease, right? But so we need to, we need to identify who are they, who are they? All right, so let's look at these two patients, uh, case one. So 41-year-old male, no known medical illness, fever for five days and you, uh, uh, has got some upper respiratory tract symptoms, no shortness of breath, blood tests, white account six, uh, platelet 200, ALC is 2.3. Sorry about this, uh, probably changed. CRP is about six uh, and then about four and four. Yeah, There's supposed to be an arrow here, lah, six, four and four. Um, rest of the blood test is all normal, hemodynamically stable, uh, saturation is 100% on room air, and this patient never actually needed oxygen. Let's look at the second patient, all right? So, and, and, and you know that chest X-ray has very little ground glass. You can, you, can, you can make out very little ground glass here. This is quite typical where they get a peripheral ground glass kind of a look. All right, and this is case two. 44-year-old uh, female, uh, obese, uh, dyslipidemia, fever for five days in URTI, no shortness of breath, blood tests, whites account is 55, a platelet is 280, absolute lymphocyte count is 2.5, CRP is 32 baseline, blood pressure is 140 or 57, and pulse rate 70, saturation room air is also 98%. So both are in their day five of illness, and uh, uh, both of them have... Uh, 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 both of them basically um, uh, have no requirement for oxygen on baseline. As you can see, the chest X-ray infiltrates are slightly more for this patient where you can see bilateral, very high haziness and probably more so on the right side and uh, more so in the periphery as well. 
All right. So if we look at these patients, a the category one and two or three patients, who are the ones who actually require antivirals? All right. So at the moment, how we're treating is um, uh, category three patients, right? Generally, there's no treatment required. This is basically taken from our guidelines, right? Close observation of vital signs and oxygen monitoring as stated in monitoring guidelines. We treat with favipiravir, which is at the moment um, uh, we, we take consent from every patient who is being given favipiravir or because we are still uh, uh, probably collecting data on favipiravir. But favipiravir has been approved in uh, India, Japan, and China, and FDA approved their own FDA approval to, to treat COVID-19, right? So treat with favipiravir is category four if patient has any one of the following risk factors. Age more than 50 with comorbids, end-stage renal failure patients, uh, and uh, in the patients in the presence of any warning signs. All right, but and what does our guidelines say? Um, uh, at the moment, we actually use favipiravir in category four and five, and three, we use favipiravir in category three if they have any of these risk factors that we went through just now. All right, and what is the evidence of favipiravir? So we know that higher dose is actually tolerable. Initially, we we're using lower dose of favipiravir, but there's enough evidence has actually come out that higher dose is quite tolerable. And uh, faster clinical recovery shows faster clinical recovery. It's not an inferior uh, and resolution of symptoms compared to standard of care by day seven. All right. And some studies shows faster viral clearance by day five. And this could just mean the natural progression of the disease, but uh, progression needing oxygen is 20 to 28%. But if you look at all these trials, the earlier you start favipiravir, the benefit is higher for these patients. All right. And it's, and, and there are three papers that basically looked at uh, tolerability profile and end stage renal failure patients who are in regular HD. All right. And it shows that they don't develop, uh, develop much side effects. And um, uh, a recent meta-analysis paper that basically came out looked at clinically deterioration was less significant in the favipiravir group with an odds ratio of 0 0.59. And, um, and uh, however, uh, this data is a bit conflicting because the confidence interval does cross one last, so they may not be, so we might not really use this odds ratio. And of course, oxygen support requirements and non-invasive mechanical ventilation was not statistically significant, the difference between the group that received Fabi and the one who did it. But however, what we do know is it's quite a safe drug to use, and um, but it can cause a bit of hyperuricemia and GI disturbances, all right? And, and we must be aware of some of the drug interactions uh, uh, associated with favipiravir. And um, I haven't seen much neutropenia, but definitely uh, GI symptoms will be there, but they're very mild and some develop uh, uh, elevated transaminases, but none of them required um, uh, con discontinuation of therapy due to severe uh, adverse effects. All right. And of course, it's got a teratogenic effect. All right. So in this group, favipiravir, they used. Um, uh, so after stopping favipiravir, um, uh, the previous. Uh, so I just got uh, this one from uh, from uh, uh, a reply. So my pharmacist group just got a reply from the company that supplies favipiravir. And they do advise extending contraception up to 14 days after the last dose of favipiravir. All right. So, and uh, avoid GFR, but we are reconfirming that with them. But at the moment in the guidelines, we say use contraception for about seven days, right? And uh, avoid if uh, the creatinine clearance is less than 30. And as I said before, this is not a registered drug or an officially approved drug by WHO for favipiravir. Uh, so it does require patient consent to administer. And when you look at any other uh, um, antiviral drug, we know Solidarity was one of the biggest trials uh, for repurposing to, uh, that looked at drugs that were repurposed for, for COVID-19. And we saw that it really didn't make a difference. None of the drugs actually did make a difference. But if you closely look at the NIH study, if you look at the NIH study, it did say that remdesivir had an effect on patients who required oxygen. Hmm? All right, so it did show that it had an effect on patients with uh, who actually required oxygen, and there was faster time to clinical recovery. 
all right? And if you look at, uh, this is a guide for us, uh, for even for future references, if you look at international guidelines regarding when an antiviral is basically, uh, 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 should be considered for patients. So it, uh, IDSA's guideline recommends the use of remdesivir when patients are hypoxic, so not on patients who are not symptomatic, all right? And uh, of course, WHO doesn't recommend any drugs outside of a clinical trial. And of course, NIH recommends the use of remdesivir in patients who require supplemental oxygen. Now, if you look at our data regarding who gets severe disease, it's quite clear patients more than 50 years old sort of have almost a doubling risk of developing more severe disease. We also looked at uh, a paper that, uh, that uh, looked at patients who, who are in the 40 to 60 group and the presence of comorbidity in those patients increased the risk factor of them uh, deteriorating. All right, and when we looked at each comorbidity, the only thing that really stand stand, uh, of course, all of them had an odds ratio of developing uh, severe disease, but chronic kidney disease uh, or end stage renal failure had 17 times more risk of developing more severe disease. All right, and what are the warning signs in patients that we generally look out for? We basically look out for fever, exertional dyspnea, which we pick up through uh, the, uh, the sit to stand test, persistent symptoms, those who are tachypnic, those who have uh, oxygenation uh, less than 95%, uh, exertional hypoxia, um, uh, laboratory, a single rise in CRP, a rising CRP or a single value of CRP more than 50 milligrams per, per liter, and of course, a dropping absolute lymphocyte count and a radiological imaging of uh, uh, increasing or worsening infiltrate or a single chest X-ray showing uh, um, um, severe uh, pneumonic changes. All right, this is uh, yet to, uh, yet to uh, publish data uh, we, we basically looked at three hospitals and we wanted to, to sort of validate the warning signs that we were looking, that we were mentioning in the guidelines, right? So identification of warning signs in patients progressing to severe disease. What we looked at are about two. So uh, Hospital Sungai Bulo, Malacca and Lahat Datu collected data on 228 patients who were admitted a day of um, uh, were admitted with mild illness, yeah, sorry, typo, and looked at their risk factors for deterioration, all right? And the median, we saw that the median day of deterioration is about 10 days, but it could be anywhere from eight to day eight to day 12 of illness. Um, and the univariate analysis saw that the presence of fever, high mu score, increased zone of chest X-ray involvement, CRP more than 50, and an and an increase in a neutrophil lymphocyte ratio was associated with deterioration. Multivariate analysis identified a higher mu score, the presence of two or more comorbids, and, an, and a CRP more than 50 as a risk factor for deterioration. All right, so monitoring guidelines in CAT3 patients, as said before. So generally, we routinely uh, uh, take vital signs monitoring twice, uh, three times a day. However, in the presence of risk factor, vital signs monitoring can be increased. The frequency of uh, we do monitoring does increase, right? So if further clinical deterioration, we do increase frequency of monitoring as well. Uh, doctors, minimally, they review three times a day. And of course, at every review, the patients are looked at for exertional desaturation test. Now, when we look at the blood test results, everybody gets an x-ray and a baseline uh, bloods um, uh, at, at presentation at baseline. And if there's presence of any warning signs, we repeat at least full blood count in CRP. Some centers I know does not, does not have CRP or takes a long time for it to come back. The uh, centers use LDH as well. Some centers use LDH as well, all right? If no warning signs, now, because we routinely discharge patients at day nine and day 10, we started advocating and we started seeing patients um, uh, who deteriorate beyond that. As you can see, the, 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 the warning sign study showed that some patients can deteriorate even up to day 12. So routinely, but routinely what we do is we actually repeat a full blood count CRP and a chest X-ray at day nine and day 10 of disease. And if it's all clear, and there's no signs of an increasing CRP, it should be safe to discharge uh, the patients, all right? So other blood tests and, 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 and uh, other blood tests repeat as indicated, all 
All right, so baseline ECG for patients with risk factors. And of course, chest X-ray um, if patients develop any warning signs. All right, so this is a follow-up of the same patients. Huh? This is a follow-up. So this is uh, just to recap, it's a 44-year-old lady, uh, dyslipidemia, obese, fever for five days with URTI, and she had no shortness of breath on presentation. So this was a CRP uh, 30, absolute lymphocyte count 2.5. Um, uh, sorry, hold on. Uh, absolute lymphocyte count 2.5. Um, oxygenation still on room air, and we started on Favipirave, all right, because she's obese, she's got dyslipidemia, and a slightly increased CRP at baseline, all right, and she already had chest x-ray evidence of pneumonia, right, day six, CRP went up to 34, as you can see, at day 11, the CRP went up to 70, so we repeated CRP quite, um, quite regularly, because um, uh, often enough, Patients with higher CRP, we do see a tend for them to deteriorate. So we monitor them very, very closely. Yeah, And, um, and uh, uh, this patient detected 3% a drop in the exertional DSAT test. Uh, so from 98% it went up to, uh, sorry, from 96% went down to 93%. And this patient was actually started on DEXA 12 milligram daily. All right, and, uh, and the next day, uh, it went down to 50, uh, still requiring oxygen, DEXA 12 milligram daily, Favipirave completed, and this patient was doing well. So this was day five, x-ray at day five, and this was the time where, uh, where she developed uh, oxygen requirement. Now, as you can see, there's worsening of ground glass uh, changes in the peripheries as well as sentry. Right. So discharge criteria for category three, patient with mild to moderate disease were not severely immunocompromised, at least 10 days have passed since symptom onset first appeared, and at least 24 hours have passed since. So this is a CDC guideline, which will also reflect uh, our guidelines uh, soon. So at least 24 hours have passed since last fever without the use of fever reducing medicine. So asymptomatic, lah, okay? And their symptoms like cough, shortness of breath, all have improved. All right, so a closer look at category four illness, um, um, and then we'll start addressing questions. So these are basically patients with pneumonia who require oxygen, huh? most severe disease. So we, the category four illness, so patients who, who, who progress on from an early stage of pulmonary phase into a later stage of pulmonary phase, um, uh, there's been many studies right after the recovery studies that shows that this that that this is the time interval. This is the time where these patients will start requiring steroids. It's a very steroid responsive disease, right? It's a steroid responsive disease, and and a recovery trial has shown that mortalities have improved due to the usage of steroids. But debate is still ongoing. Uh, uh, feverishly um, regarding how much steroids is actually needed in these patients. So this is the dexamethasone recovery study. As you can see, the use of dexamethasone was six milligram daily uh, uh, um, uh, for 10 days. And obviously the, the, the patients uh, who received dexamethasone did better if they required oxygen, all right? So, if the patient does not require oxygen, there is no use for dexamethasone. Actually, usual care is better and it causes more uh, hazardous effect if you actually start patients on dexamethasone too early when they don't require any oxygen at all or have no signs of hyperinflammatory phase, all right? But you need to take the, uh, the recovery study with a pinch of salt. The reason is because there was no data on severely ill patients, all right? And, and if you look at the recovery study, there was still a lot more mortality in the patients who were actually given steroids, whether they required ventilation or not, all right? So this raises some question regarding the dosage of steroids in these patients, all right? So I wanted to go through with you some of the lessons we learned along the way uh, from category four patients, all right? Lesson number one, some switch off with a very short course of dexamethasone. They may not even need 10 days, all right? But they switch off. So this is a patient, uh, 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 I'm sorry, I don't have his age. So 50 year old, uh, diabetic, um, came in with a CRP of 12, 
by day eight of illness started requiring oxygen. The CRP jumped from 36 to 60, uh, very high ferritin levels. All the inflammatory markers are very high. Lah. Ferritin is very high. D-dimer is very high. Required oxygen, already given favipiravir, and then completed uh, and then started dexamethasone eight milligrams daily, all right? Response to steroid was phenomenal. Within of three days, the patient was required to be off oxygen and the patient was discharged at day 40 and 48 hours with a total dexa dose of about 10 days, all right? This was day eight of uh, illness and this is day 12 of illness close to its discharge. The infiltrates were much better, all right? Lesson two. Sometimes we need to try, we, soon we realized that one dose of dexamethasone doesn't fit everybody, all right? We need to titrate up the dexamethasone dose depending on the severity of inflammation we are dealing with, all right? So this is a 58-year-old diabetic and hypertensive presented at day nine of illness with a low absolute lymphocyte count. NLR ratio was super high already. Hmm? So day 10 of illness came in already with category <clears throat> category four disease, already required oxygen, right? Ferritin was slightly on the high side, D-diamond not so much, 199 la. So we don't think there's any pulmonary embolism going on here. So we know that the inflammation, uh, uh, the, the, the COVID-19 inflammation and the hyperinflammatory phase is the one that's contributing towards the uh, uh, oxygen requirement. So we started the patient as usual on prophylactic doses of dex, uh, uh, Clexane. And then um, um, uh, about 24 hours later, we added dexamethasone, all right? Uh, uh, previously, we were using 4 milligram BD, la, huh? but now we know actually dexamethasone is extremely long acting, so we don't need to split the dose to BD dose. So once a day, so we started him on 8 milligrams daily, right? So the next day, as you can see, the CRP went up further to 123. Not only that, the patient started becoming more and more tachypnic, all right, and was threatening to increase the oxygen requirement. All right. And uh, total 12 milligrams of DEXA was actually given. So uh, increasing chest X-ray infiltrates, increasing CRP, patient becoming more tachypnic. Although the oxygen requirement hasn't gone up tremendously, this is already a warning to the clinician treating that this patient is going to progress. All right. So we, we, we at that point, we just increased the dexamethasone to 6 milligram BD. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the next few days, as we can see, the CRP slowly settled and the patient was off oxygen, all right? And, uh, and, uh, and uh, we were able to taper him off uh, uh, dexamethasone at day eight and he was discharged well, all right? And then we started seeing dexamethasone failures, all right? There may be some patients who are dexamethasone failures. So here, 57-year-old diabetic lady, breast cancer, mastectomy done recently, presented on day seven of illness, required nasal prong, clinical category four, given dexamethasone on day one, the whole lot, the, 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 uh, the, the same cocktail, dexa, favipiravir, clexin, and the desaturates further and starts requiring face mask five liters within 24 hours, all right? So this were her blood parameters. So when she came in, she already required a nasal prong. As you can see, CRP is already high, 118, all right? And then uh, went on the next day, started requiring more and more oxygen, all right? Dexamethasone, eight milligrams daily, nothing to do with community or quiet pneumonia. Procastronin was low. We didn't suspect anything, but cultures were also no growth. This was around the time where we became more and more confident with using metapret. We had some, uh, some, some experience managing with our intensivist colleagues in ICU, and we started using methoprednisolone in the wards, all right, so on the 7th of uh, November, where, uh, where her oxygen requirement was high, we quickly gave her metoprat 150 milligrams daily, once a day. So this is equivalent to 1.5 milligram per kg, all right, to two. So that's the dose that we will use, 1.5 milligram per kg to 2 milligram per kg. Uh, and uh, and uh, soon after, she started requiring uh, less and less oxygen, and we were able to wean her off took her off DEXA. We just use metoprat for that crucial time interval and then we'll switch to a more uh, uh, an equivalent doses of DEXA and take them off it. 
All right. So this was six. Uh, this was this was the time when she started requiring more oxygen, and this was the time uh, which was nearing towards discharge. And you can see the the action of the uh, of methopred is 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 uh, is more profound. Line on the patient were able to take off oxygen faster. All right. And uh, lesson four is. Uh, important lesson is basically to watch out for thromboembolism, all right? This is a paper that basically looked at uh, 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 a large number of patients um, and showed that thrombosis was a significant event, all right? In all those patients who are hospitalized with COVID-19, we also see quite a significant amount of thromboembolism uh, in our patients all right, and uh, uh, when we tried to correlate in this study, when they tried to correlate between the uh, D dimer and uh, and uh, so for whoever who actually um, uh, can get quantitative levels of D dimer, an increasing D dimer or a single high value, maybe like this cutoff here, maybe more than two thousand, is at more higher risk of actually developing pulmonary embolism. We are also studying this in Sungai Buloh. Uh, we are also studying this in Sungai Buloh and also looking at the correlation between D-dimer levels and, and, and uh, the CTPA findings of uh, thromboembolism, right? And recently, uh, it was also said some patients, uh, they show very high lymphocyte level and uh, they have very low uh, IL-6 levels. So you don't think that this is actually due to hyperinflammation phase. The, the reason for the significant hypoxia could well be due to the microthrombosis or the microangiopathic changes that happen in the blood vessel that basically supply the alveoli, right? And, uh, and of course, consider pulmonary embolism. If you can't do a CTPA, consider pulmonary embolism. If you have an increasing or a very high D-dimer uh, plus a, a worsening hypoxemia, you know, tachycardia or ECG findings consistent of a PE, or you have an acute unexplained right heart strain uh, or an intracardiac thrombus or a clotting of vascular devices, like, you know? So, uh, these kind of patients who are uh, acutely deteriorating and requiring a lot of oxygen, sometimes we do prophylact empirically treat them as, as PE as well while waiting uh, for, a, for a CTPA to be done later when they're more stable, all right? So this is the dose that we use, full anticoagulation, one milligram per kg in a confirmed case. Uh, uh, prophylaxis, of course, 30 to 40 milligrams daily uh, in all patients requiring supplemental oxygen. There are a, major, uh, a small minority of patients uh, like I mentioned before, where the inflammatory phase uh, markers may not be very elevated, all right? Or these are patients who are, who are severely intubated in ICU with an FiO2 of 80 to 80% uh, to 100%, right? These patients may benefit from a higher dose prophylaxis um, uh, in certain cases, all right? So lesson five, the, I think this is the last lesson. So it's very important, like I said earlier, timing of intervention is very important, all right? So do not start DEXA too early, all right? So it's a 48-year-old diabetic, day six of illness, last two days prior to admission, worsening cough and shortness of breath. On arrival, he was, he was, uh, he was desaturated 92%. CRP was 13 to 23 all right. And as you can see, yes, it's a scary looking x-ray with infiltrates in the lung. Yes, the patient was hypoxic, but he showed no signs of hyperinflammation. So CRP is low. It's only uh, uh, um, CRP is low. It's this day six of illness. Ferritin is extremely low. And we have trend showing us there's no hyperinflammation phase. But what we really saw is the white cell count, the lymphocyte percentage was actually increasing from 29% to 35%. All right. So this patient was actually started on favipiravi and given one dose of interferons. No steroids were started and patient was discharged well on the 19th. As you can see, the lymphocyte percentage went up very high. And this patient showed no signs of hyperinflammatory phase, all right? And uh, we were able to take him off and discharge him without any uh, steroids at this point, all right? This goes back to the pathophysiology surrounding hypoxia, which is not just hyperinflammatory phase, but also we need to think about 
viral replication. Now, if we are dealing with a disease like influenza or H1N1, which actually has a very good effective antiviral, uh, uh, we may not be seeing patients like this, all right? So uh, we need to, at the back of our mind, also think about patients' uh, uh, intensive viral replication phase reading up to hypoxia, reading up to the hypoxia, but closely monitoring their blood levels as well. All right, and uh, this is, a, a, this is a, the same lesson, so don't start too early. So case two, 54-year-old diabetic and hypertensive. Again, very low CRPs at day four to day eight. However, patients started requiring oxygen. <clears throat> patients started requiring oxygen from the start, all right? And the patient was started on the routine cocktail, Clexin, Dexan, and we added Favipiravir because the patient came very early. But ho and behold, on day 10 is when the hyperinflammatory phase kicked in and starting Dexa early doesn't, trust me, doesn't seem to uh, 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 prevent the patient going into hyperinflammatory phase. So we had to resort to methylpred and the patient worsened even more and we had to transfer him to ICU and gave him pulse steroids. All right. And of course, um, very fast. If I want to talk about every single, we need more time. So statins, because of the pathophysiology of uh, uh, um, uh, hypoxia in COVID-19 that we talked about before. There's enough evidence, uh, there's good evidence for statins being added in those with refractory hypoxia. Uh, if uh, patients, uh, places, sorry, hospitals where you can actually do uh, uh, HRCTs or CTPA, uh, some of the radiologists, we've got a radiologist, we've got a, a respiratory radiologist, um, and, uh, and uh, she basically can pick up and saying these are due to there's some features suggestive of microangiopathic changes in the lung that could contribute towards the hypoxia. So there are studies that say use of statins, uh, uh, less stronger for aspirin in, in, uh, in uh, these patients. Ivermectin is coming up like how hydroxychloroquine came up earlier in the disease, but of course we need more data to use it and we will be running a trial soon uh, comparing, uh, 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 com comparing these medicines to standard of care. And of course, tocilizumab. All right, so um, initially there were some reports saying it was useful and then there were reports saying it's not useful. But after the remap cap trial came out, um, it showed that the relative reduction in mortality by 24% works when given early when patient required ventilation early or NIV, right? And, uh, but, the, but what we are waiting for is a full report of remap cap because we want to see what doses of steroids they were actually using in this study, in this data we do not have, all right? And of course, do not underestimate the, the, the role of, uh, of positioning in these patients. There are many studies that basically say if we, we encourage patients to prone uh, uh, often enough, yeah, um, it's actually very good and it will help us uh, ventilate the lung uh, better. All right. And of course, discharge criteria for CAT4, of course, at least 10 days of illness uh, uh, should pass. And up to 20 days have passed since symptoms first appeared. Uh, 10 up to 20 days. So 10 days is minimal, but up to 20 days. And at least 24 hours, they must be fever free. All right. And symptoms must have improved. Of course, case to case basis and severely immunocompromised cases, um, we may need to extend the period of isolation and consider consultation with infection control as experts as you go along. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope I kept my time. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Yasmin. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think you squeezed a lot of information in that short period of time and uh, kudos. Well done. Uh, I'm sure all of us will remember the five lessons you taught. Actually, I thought you have a lot more lessons, but you were kind and you have uh, uh, concised it for us to, to take home today. Now, we have plenty of questions and uh, I will try to go through them as fast as possible. I, first off, I want to apologize. I'm sure we cannot finish the questions. They are really, really, really 50 over questions. So Yasmin, I do think, okay, hang on, hang on, don't worry. We will, we will try to group the questions together and uh, look at maybe some diagnostic ones and look at some uh, 
much more related to management. Is that all right? Yep. Okay. Uh, are you ready, uh, Yasmin? It's going to yep. be fast and furious. Okay. Yep. All right. Okay. Let's start with something relatively easy. Relatively, what's the rate of reinfection of COVID nineteen in Malaysia? Now, I'm not sure whether we have much too much data on that. Yeah. But uh, how much is the rate of infection reinfection, and how would you treat this group? Right. Um, um, we don't have, like, like that's what Chris just said, uh, we don't have much data on reinfection of COVID-19. Cases that we suspect reinfection will be those who come in with a, uh, another COVID swab, symptomatic COVID swab, um, after about 90 days. So the first, um, uh, a lot of international uh, data is available, although Malaysia doesn't have data, international data is available, where CDC also says up to 90 days, we don't think that they can get reinfected again. Lah. So after 90 days, if someone actually comes in with significant COVID uh, uh, relatable disease, then we will treat them as a uh, new COVID infection, basically. Some of the time we looked at CT value. Now, when you talk to microbiologists, uh, about CT value, all of them will see the same thing. Do not just look at the CT value because it's just a surrogate marker for a viral load. But generally, our evidence is so that if your CT value is more than 30, you're probably dealing with a non-viable uh, 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 virus. Right. right. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, next one. Uh, what is the rate of now, I, I need to read this. I'm sure you can see it as well. What is the rate of false positive results for the PCR? And whether you want to also address the range of normal ranges for CT values for whether it's E gene or R gene. I can tell uh, you what is the sensitivity and specificity of PCR, which is about 88%. And it's better if you have two PCRs together, but I, I um, probably I'm not the person to answer the rate of false positive PCR. La. So I, I, I think we talked about CT value already just now. Right. No, the, but probably the false positivity, if it does occur in any big way, is often the contamination issue at the laboratory level or the specimen collection level. But generally, if it's positive, it tends to be positive, clearly. Yeah. Uh, false negative or positive can happen depending on a lot of factors, including the way you take specimen, obviously. Okay. So we're going to move on, okay? Uh, gosh, there's a lot. <laughs> uh, okay, Yasmin, just last question on diagnostics. How okay. should we interpret an in, in how should we interpret an inconclusive COVID-19 PCR test? Okay, so if you've got a symptomatic patient plus a high, a high epid link plus disease compatible or COVID, keep repeating it until it becomes positive. Keep repeating it okay. until the suspicion is there. If the patient gets better but then too negative, I suppose, then okay. But if the patient doesn't improve, we should be looking for it. And of course, don't forget influenza as well. Similar uh, uh, hypoxic presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, obviously, we need to correlate with the patient's yeah. uh, condition. Yeah. Yep. Okay, uh, I'm going to move over towards more of some of the uh, so-called newer or isoteric therapies that people have talked about, all right? Uh, yep. Start off with something like vitamin C. Right. Uh, any comments about vitamin C for COVID? Right, so vitamin C for COVID um, uh, has come up quite a bit from ranging from doses from uh, uh, one gram BD up to six grams uh, uh, per day in, uh, in ICU patients. Uh, the science behind it makes sense where it's uh, basically to reduce the inflammation. Actually, most of these alternate uh, therapies or, 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 or adjuvant therapies for, for uh, COVID-19 stems from the fact that it reduces inflammation. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, ICU is collecting data on it. Uh, uh, so we'll just have to wait until, uh, I know it's being practiced in ICU, so ICU is still collecting data, so we'll just have to wait for that. Well, I think the reality of COVID-19, uh, as you mentioned, especially in terms of, uh, of course, we know the anti-inflammatories have, have sort of maintained their role, but yeah. in terms of our antivirals, really, we are, we are not that yet, not there yet, no. obviously. Gotcha. So I think a lot of these adjuvant therapies will come in but you know, uh, repurposed use of medications yep. will come in. Uh, but I guess if they are safe and they cause very little harm, yep. I, can, I guess in desperate cases, really, I, I, I have no issues trying something like that, obviously. Yep. Vitamin C, what the heck, isn't it? Right, let's move on. What about vitamin D? Well, let's finish off the vitamins first, all right? What about vitamin D? What are your thoughts about vitamin D? Vi uh, you know, endocrine people suggested something about vitamin yep. D deficiency, isn't it? 
Yep. So uh, again, it's all about uh, uh, um, cytokine response, uh, uh, localized target uh, organ organ specific cytokine response. So that means it only affects the lung, lung you know, uh, in, in COVID-19. So some of these vitamins that, uh, that are involved in, in reducing this inflammatory phase have been suggested routinely to use. I know that the endocrine society, um, uh, some of them are actually doing studies in, in, uh, in uh, uh, vitamin D use in, uh, uh, in uh, COVID-19 patients. We are yet to begin it. Uh, and I think some of the, uh, even some of the ICUs are not routinely using it. I think the, the, the evidence of vitamin C is slightly higher than vitamin D. But, but are yes, we, are, we, are we testing vitamin D levels at all? No, uh, no, no. We're not testing vitamin D levels because um, the, the, the turnaround time for these tests are uh, very uh, long, uh, Dr. Chris. And because of the infection control thing, we couldn't, we couldn't make it as a routine thing. Right, right. Okay, point taken. Right. Uh, okay, I'm going to move on to, to the other therapies. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, I saw a question on Evermectin, but I've lost it. I'm really getting so young nowadays. Evermectin, uh, we know that we're going to start a study on Evermectin yes. uh, in, uh, in the hospitals in Malaysia fairly yep. soon. Yep. Uh, maybe go through with us whatever data you have or whatever okay. info you have okay. on Ivermectin. Um, Ivermectin, I think, started off with Bangladesh and a few other countries. And, um, and um, uh, the, the, the summary of, of, of uh, all these studies, although these are underpower, small, small, small studies, but I suppose they, it's starting off like how hydroxychloroquine has started, but it seems to have slightly better data when it comes to uh, faster viral clearance, uh, 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 outcome in patients, and of course, reduces time of hospitalization. So it seems to have a bit more favorable um, uh, um, data in terms of outcome in, in COVID-19 compared to what hydroxychloroquine. So when hydroxychloroquine first came out, again, both of them, are, 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 are they are used for their anti-inflammatory effects. But hydroxychloroquine studies did show that the, 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 it had very minimal effect on, on, uh, on disease uh, progression. But ivermectin seems to be coming up slightly better compared to how hydroxychloroquine studies are. And we are also interested to know its use in, 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 in patients. So we will be embarking on uh, uh, ivermectin study versus standard of care or, or depending what the protocol is going to look like soon. So hopefully, right. hopefully in the coming months, we'll be able to share something better. Right. Uh, just, just to, to uh, inform everyone, uh, I think the uh, many of the hospitals within Malaysia that are looking after COVID-19 will come together to do a uh, very period trial, yeah. uh, which probably will be faster because I think it's closer to recruitment. Yeah. I, and also Evermectin, which will take a little bit longer perhaps. So hopefully in the next few months to come, we may get some localized Malaysian data uh, on that. Now, uh, I, I know there are other... There are many questions also on other uh, uh, complementary type of adjuvant, uh, adjuvant type of therapy, but I apologize, I, I can't get to, to them. Uh, let's talk about a drug that we know well, the, the importance of which Yasmin has stressed many times in her presentation is the steroids. Now, there's a question here, I think you may have alluded to it, but I think it's best that we clarify this so people know exactly the role of the steroids. The question here is how do you decide when and how long to give IV metalprep or DEXA in category three patients? Uh, maybe, Jasmine, if you could put it in a nutshell for us. Okay. So, um, approved indication for dexamethasone are patients requiring oxygen, right? So, but you also need to look at it as a disease perspective. Is this patient needing oxygen because of, uh, of uh, a hyperinflammatory phase or due to a uh, extensive viral replication, which we can't really tell. So an increasing CRP, an increasing neutrophil percentage, and of course, people say an increasing NLR, which is a neutrophil lymphocyte ratio. Um, uh, but if uh, uh, Lizzie want to count the NLR, just look at the neutrophil percentage. If your neutrophil percentage is starting to look like a bacterial disease where the neutrophil count is slowly increasing, 50%, 70%, 80%, and your CRP is also increasing, an increasing CRP, plus a patient who has a positive exertional desaturation test, which is a 3% drop from its baseline, you're probably looking at a patient who will respond to steroids. So that's 
possibly when I'll start steroids. Now, I'm sure there's another question down here, but uh, just in case we don't get to it, sometimes when the patient does not, is threatening to go into that. So there will be patients where the, the saturation never drops, but you're dealing with a very high CRP. Right, you're probably looking at uh, a, a CRP more than uh, uh, 50, and uh, and uh, and a chest X-ray actually looks severe pneumonia. Uh, patient's tachycardic, and uh, and of course you've already covered for 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 infection, and you know that this patient is and it's confirmed COVID, and you know at any point interval this patient is probably going to pro pro progress. So we do start slightly early for these patients, and and uh, and. Uh, um, some most of them do have a good recovery. So we start early because we know this patient's going to deteriorate. So it's giving you all the warning signs this patient's going to deteriorate. So that's how I will use uh, uh, steroids. Uh, I'll take two more questions. Uh, yeah. And I purposely chose something that's a bit different. Uh, I think you talk about the thromboembolic issues that we see in COVID-19 and has mm -hmm. driven our management really crazy with all the clots that we see. The yeah. question here is talking about should all COVID patients be treated with full treatment dose of heparin for PE, full treatment dose, instead of thromboprophylaxis uh, from the outset, as since it's often fatal? Maybe just go through again the rationale and the way we use uh, 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 heparin or plexane in this case. Right. So, uh, sorry, I can't see the question. Okay. So, we, 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 we use, um, all right. So it's, it's whether, so the question is asking whether uh, I should be using from the start uh, 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 treatment doses of uh, uh, right. Right. Net, yeah, treatment doses of Clexane. So, so guys, um, um, there's not, there's, the pathophysiology is basically for microthrombis. So when you look at the evidence behind, um, um, uh, when you look at the evidence behind usage of Clexane, a majority of patients actually do well with just prophylaxis dose of, of, of Clexane. However, we do empirically treat patients for, uh, uh, with, with full dose anticoagulation in certain scenarios. Lah. So if you actually have a patient who has a very high uh, hypoxia and you know that you can't send this patient for a CTPA, they have clotted lines, they're starting to get clot lines and uh, patient's very tachycardic, requiring increasing oxygen support or has a predisposing, uh, a predisposing um, uh, uh, risk factor for developing thromboembolism, I don't think it's wrong if we actually give them empirical treatment for, for, for uh, uh, with Clexane in, in its full treatment dose. But to start it for everybody, um, uh, I don't think it's necessary because uh, most of the studies we use uh, um, uh, that showed the benefit for thromboembolism and even the international guidelines do recommend uh, uh, it's sufficient if we start off with a uh, uh, prophylaxis dose of Clexane and escalate it according to patients, uh, uh, escalate it according to certain patients. And as you know, it's not just pure thromboembolism, microangiopathic changes in the lung also is, uh, is a, is a, is a, uh, is a pathophysiology to hypoxia. And recently, if not mistaken, uh, one of the recovery trial uh, results did mention that patients given very high doses of prophylaxis uh, ended up with, with, uh, uh, with upper GI bleeds and adverse events. So we probably need to take it as a, as a, as a holistic content uh, uh, holistically before we decide to give everybody uh, treatment doses of um, of I, I would echo what Yasmin has said just now. Clearly, uh, we have seen patients because we are talking about very many are very frail and old folks, uh, and we certainly have seen upper GI bleeds, mm. uh, and of course that can be extremely detrimental. So I think we need to rationalize uh, the use of the heparin uh, uh, therapy. Like, yeah. Uh, okay, I'm gonna take, give the last question, and this is uh, since I'm the moderator, I get to bully everyone. So I'm going to ask my own question. You. Mm. Yasmin, don't run away, no lah, Yasmin. Uh, I need to clarify this because obviously uh, something that Yasmin hadn't talked about, many of these patients who uh, survive COVID, many of them have pretty messed up lungs. Their lungs are very, a lot of organizing pneumonia, a lot of fibrosis going on. Uh, currently, I'm uh, 
serving under the pleasure of Dr. Suresh Kumar in Hospital Sungai Bulo and looking after some of the post-COVID cases that Yasmin sends down to me. Thank you, Yasmin. I must thank you for that. Uh, and we see many of them, many of them older people who struggle for weeks and weeks and weeks in our ward, uh, still hooked on to the oxygen. And uh, this word of organizing pneumonia has yeah. come up frequently over and over again. And of course, that is linked to the way we use steroids after the uh, inflammatory phase or hyper-inflammatory phase of COVID. So perhaps, uh, Yasmin, give a short discussion on how we deal with organizing pneumonias and what is the literature so far, because it's still a fairly new thing, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yasmin, please. So um, um, we've had this discussion many times between our respiratory colleagues and our respiratory radiologists. And recently, we also they also uh, very, very uh, graciously linked us up with the UK Bromston Hospital. Uh, so the recipe team actually takes care of these uh, patients. Uh, so they, 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 they get the patients uh, from the infectious disease physician or the general physician, and they manage the, the, the recipe component of it. So many of these patients actually need Need, uh, uh, oxygen, high flow nasal cannula, some are still intubated, uh, some of them need ECMO and stuff like that. And um, the recipe, there's, there's two school of thoughts, one saying they, they don't require so much uh, steroids, another one saying steroids is the mainstay of therapy, right? So this is still pretty much uh, a, a debate between the uh, uh, many experts. But uh, from our experience, we think it's still a very steroid responsive disease. And we are eagerly awaiting IPR's collection of all these step-down care to them to see whether uh, 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 whether whether uh, patients recover from it. But a favorable response from IPR has been many patients. These organizing pneumonia that develops is probably going to be a reversible one to some degree, depending on how ill the patients were, how young the patients are, or how older the patients are, or how frail they were to start off with. And steroids seems to be the mainstay of therapy in these patients where they are started on, on uh, they, they would have probably gotten a, a lot of steroids and then they are stepped down to prednisone and they are tapered off over like a 30 uh, day to six weeks kind of a period. And, uh, and uh, many of the patients, um, uh, uh, the younger ones, uh, they do recover from it, but it actually takes time. And um, the decision to, to tailor down the steroids or even to initiate uh, a, a more continuation uh, or a more prolonged dose of steroids is quite an intense one where we routinely do, in Sungai Bulo, we routinely do CD scans and we, we discuss the CD scans with our radiologists and they decide, yes, this is significant organizing pneumonia would actually require no one has actually attempted to, there have been one or two cases in which we've actually done bronc uh, in these patients to see whether the organizing pneumonia is, is, is rich with, with, uh, with uh, inflammatory cells or not. And one or two cases showed that it's actually devoid of inflammatory cases, uh, inflammatory. So it's, it's not what we call the H phenotype. Uh, it's actually fibrosis of the lung that develops. Of course, the exact pathophysiology behind organizing pneumonia, they don't really know. But uh, it seems to be more of a cryptogenic kind than, than the general organizing pneumonia that, that, that we all have seen post-infections uh, before. La. So it seems to be a distinct group of uh, patients who develop pulmonary fibrosis in some cases may be reversible, some cases may not be reversible to, 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 to some degree, and they do respond to steroids. However, of course, a lot more data is needed uh, uh, Dr. Chris, in order for us to routinely Thank use you. this as a practice. Uh, Thank you very much, Yasmin. Uh, I think we'll be seeing a lot more such cases because we are already seeing them. Uh, for those who survive and pull through, uh, especially the older and frail ones, you're right, they tend to struggle for a very, very long time post-COVID, hooked on to the oxygen. And many have gone home uh, with home oxygen therapy as well. Yeah. Right, I, I really have to close because the organizers are giving me the... Uh, giving me the eye already. Uh, so I, I must thank uh, Yasmin. I think you did a fantastic job uh, mm -hmm. squeezing everything into a, a, a very concise package for all of us. Now, uh, so, so Yasmin, thank you, thank you, thank you. Eh? So now you can go back to work, okay? So okay. Suresh Kumar won't complain about us. Uh, but uh, so further good news, uh, the organizers, uh, both my ICED and also ICR will uh, send out through social media 
what we call pandemic pearls. Uh, we will select out key points that uh, the speakers have uh, put across and put it in short social mess uh, social messages on platform on social media platform, uh, either on Twitter, Facebook, and the like, and so that people who do who miss this or didn't hear the whole thing could still learn something for the, from these uh, webinars. So with that, it just gives me the pleasure of thanking uh, the organizers, uh, my ICID as well as ICR, and also thank Yasmin especially for her excellent and really very informative presentation. Uh, short summary. Okay, we will ask, uh, sorry, Yasmin, there's some, some extra work for you. I didn't cause this. Uh, the organizers has asked you to come up with a short summary. Oh my. I, I see Yasmin is so excited now. Okay, sorry, Yasmin, it's not my fault, okay. Short oh, summary. Okay. Yes, okay, sorry, no, 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 not now, it's okay. I will talk to you and we'll put it out on social media. Oh, okay, okay. Not now, not now. Now you can go back to work. Uh, so you all, uh, also gives me a pleasure to thank the, 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 the support staff who has put this together, especially Dr. Chiu from ICR and Dr. Yanni from ICR. So with that, I hope you have found this uh, very useful and, and beneficial and uh, so that you'll be more prepared to look after COVID patients as we continue to see the search. So with that, I thank you very much for your kind attention. Have a pleasant day, have a safe day. Uh, and uh, please, hopefully, uh, Kita Jaka, Kita staff will continue to work. Thank you. Goodbye.